Welcome everybody to our uh, webinar on uh, winter wildlife tracks. Um, I would uh, like to begin by acknowledging with immense gratitude that the land on which the Canadian Wildlife Federation is located and where I also live, work and play is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Um, the Algonquin people have inhabited and cared for these lands long before today. And so we take this time to be very grateful for their care and show our gratitude and respect to them and the land that um, that provides for all of us. Um, so we have, you can see the three of us here. Um, I'm James Page. I'm a species at risk and biodiversity specialist at Canadian Wildlife Federation. Um, work on species at risk as well as iNaturalist and um, will be kind of the first presenter. Uh, I'll pass it over to Acacia, who is also here at Canadian Wildlife Federation, just to introduce herself as well. Hi, everyone. So as James said, my name is Acacia Frampong Manso, and I am the iNaturalist Engagement Coordinator here at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And Hilbert as well, who's our key presenter. Um, maybe you just introduce yourself and then we'll move on to, into the presentations. Hello, welcome. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of pictures of snow today. It's going to be exciting. Excellent. For those of us that are losing all our snow really quickly, <laughs> it's refreshing to see some good winter tracks. Um, so I don't know if Acacia and, and Hilbert, feel free to, to turn off your video if you want while I'm presenting, but um, also feel free to leave it on if you like. That's totally fine too. Uh, all right, so um, just quick um, logistics and controls. If people are having problems hearing us, uh, check your audio settings, uh, make sure Zoom has access to your speakers and all that. If that doesn't work, often leaving the um, webinar and rejoining will kind of reset things. Um, similarly, if for whatever reason, we all get kicked out, which has happened once, um, power failure, uh, just rejoin using that same initial link and we'll get it up and running right away. Uh, right now, uh, a few people have posted in the chat. Uh, right now it's set that only panelists, so Hilbert, Acacia, and myself are the only ones that will see these posts. So you can use those for technical issues or things like if you're not hearing us properly or if something's lagging in the presentation. But for any questions, um, please use the Q&A, which is down at the bottom of your screen, depending on how your controls are set up. Um, you can type your questions in. Please do this as we go. Um, we will get to them at the end that we'll pose to Hilbert, but um, as they come up in your heads, you can pose the question and then we'll compile them as we go, just so you don't you don't forget those and lose them. Um, also, for those for who are hearing impaired, there is a live transcription button um, down at, along the controls. I think it's under the more section or this there's a CC um, for closed captions. So you can click that to get a transcript. Can't guarantee how well the transcript is being in um, uh, it created in real time, but um, but there is that option. Um, so real quick about Canadian Wildlife Federation, um, we are one of Canada's largest conservation organizations, taking um, project undertaking projects in conservation across the country, um, research conservation, um, and a few key focus areas. Um, one of our mission, our, our missions is to conserve and inspire the conservation of Canada's wildlife and habitats for use enjoyment of all. Um, and we do this through a number of ways, like engaging the public and youth in citizen or community science, like iNaturalist, webinars like we're doing right now, um, education programs like Wild Outside and the Canadian Conservation Corps. Um, and then we have specific projects in the freshwater, marine and terrestrial environments, um, many of which also work on species at risk. Um, sorry, I just checking to see if there's anything in the chat that was popping up um, that I needed to look at. Um, so um, this webinar is all about wildlife tracks, um, which we're going to hear from Hilbert, but I'm going to spend a few minutes just on um, how to add some value to those tracks that you come across um, by contributing to um, a global community science database. Um, My naturalist is this global um, network of um, country-specific iterations of iNaturalist that allows the collection of wildlife observations by everyday people mm -hmm. through submitting a photo or sound recording uh, th through the iNaturalist app or online. Right now, there are about 20 countries that have their own branch, their own version of iNaturalist, just like we do here in Canada. 
Um, these are all translated into local languages and um, displayed uh, the local local species. And unnatural in Canada here is led by Canadian Wildlife Federation, along with Nature Serve Canada and Parks Canada. Um, these all feed into a global database, which you can see kind of the coverage across the world of observations. There's 170 million uh, observations around the world. Um, 13 million of these are here in Canada. Um, this data is searchable, it's downloadable by anybody, um, and it's specifically shared for conservation and research. So with conservation data centers and researchers to benefit species in Canada. Um, Information from people who affiliate with iNaturalist Canada in particular is shared more um, easily. So it, check your account settings to make sure in your settings you're affiliated with iNaturalist in Canada. That allows us better access to the observations for sharing. Um, but also the content we have um, with iNaturalist Canada is that it, it's catered to show local species. We have some help sections that are catered to, to Canada. So, um, and it is bilingual in both French and English. So that's why we're encouraging the use of iNaturalist.ca um, here in Canada, as opposed to just the general iNaturalist.org. And here's how this kind of ties back to our current theme of wildlife tracks. Uh, we've just recently created a project for wildlife tracks um, in Canada. Um, and you know, we've kind of framed this as winter tracks, but it, it's, it, is, it can be used for all year, all year long. Um, as we're as I mentioning how we're losing snow, um, tracks in mud will also count uh, that can be added to the project. Um, this automatically tallies all observations in iNaturalist in Canada um, that um, are tagged as a track. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. As you can see, the link at the top of the of the page here has the link to the project. It's also featured in the main projects page of iNaturalist.ca. So you'll be able to get to it from there. Um, you can also join the project. Um, as you see, there's only two of us that are in there so far, just because we just, just launched it. Um, but this is adding all observations from anybody, whether they've joined the project or not. The benefit of joining is that um, you'll be able to see, receive project updates um, uh, and about interesting finds and, and some resources that, uh, that we can put in through the project journal. We have some great observations already. They're just showing a few. I won't get into any of these because Hilbert's going to do a much better job of that in a few minutes. Um, so after hearing um, about this and you're super excited to check out um, some tracks, uh, you can take an extra step by adding these uh, photo of these tracks into iNaturalist. And uh, it's it's pretty easy to do this. I definitely stress that you don't need to be an expert to contribute. Um, if you can take a photo, um, you can contribute to conservation. Um, there are two ways to do this. There's a simple to use app that you can um, use to upload observations that pulls in the location and the and the date uh, of the observation. There's also a interface through the website where you can drag and drop photos um, into the this this page or go through the traditional way of clicking through the files and, and adding files that way. Um, both of these, the app and the website, um, incorporate image recognition software, which will help identify what that um, species is. And it's it's really good. I mean, tracks are to be uh, improved upon because it's definitely harder to identify tracks. But the more observations of tracks we get into it, the better the system is going to be for automatically identifying that. But the other benefit is that there's a community of over 250,000 people that are browsing iNaturalist constantly to help identify things. So if the image recognition software doesn't get it, there's a lot of people in there that can help out. And a key takeaway of this is the better the photo is, the better um, the chance and ability to identify that will be. As I mentioned, it has to have this annotation um, that it's tagged as tracks to automatically get into this project. The way to do that is if you go to iNaturalist.ca or you can do this through the, the app as well and you go to your observations or once you've created an observation. So this, this previous step here, we've created an observation, we've saved it, now it becomes part of your observations on either in the app or online. Both are kind of talking back and forth constantly. Um, it'll be show up in your list of your observations. Um, you go and you click on your observation and you can see the details of exactly what was seen, someone who has confirmed the identification, the time, the location. But then if you go down here to the 
bottom right, there's this section called annotations. And then I'm gonna bring this up a little zoomed in. What's gonna happen is when you look at that section, there's the evidence of presence. When you select that drop down arrow, there's an option to click track. Once you click track, it tags that as that observation, and then it's going to eventually pull in um, to the uh, I, the project, uh, the tracking project that we've created. Um, I'll run through a couple just photos that were were pulled on tracks, but um, Albert's going to have better better photos and and things to say about um, what makes a good track and how to identify and look for those. And so I'll end with one final note on how to get involved. There is um, the City Nature Challenge is coming up at the end of April. So April 26th to 29th, this is a, um, a global initiative, international event with nearly 40 cities taking part in Canada, along with you know around 600 around the world to gather as many wildlife observations all within the same four days around the whole world. Um, there are millions of observations that are recorded in just these four days and um, especially being this early in the season with um, potentially some snow in some areas definitely some wet areas um, think about that as you're as you're looking for tracks and can contribute to um, the city nature challenge and um, this is a map of some of the participating cities there's a few more coming on board that, that we're mapping um, and the list of where they are but um, you can head to citynaturechallenge.ca to learn more about it and which cities are participating, as well as there's an iNaturalist project that you can click through to, to learn more. And with that, I will pass it over to our main event and uh, let Hilbert talk to you about um, his, his experience and knowledge about tracks. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for hosting us. It's exciting to be here back into the winter time. Welcome to Winter Green Studios. Winter Green is a wilderness education retreat center that embodies joyful ways of living in balance with the natural world. Located in the heart of the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Reserve, just north of Sydney, Ontario, we offer a variety of workshops, courses, retreats throughout the year. We are deeply committed to learning from our Indigenous partners, providing an inclusive community that promotes equality and diversity. And with snow on the ground, let's get bundled up and get out on a hike. The magic of winter, the magic of a winter snowscape is that it is a canvas across which birds and animals act out the drama of their survival. From the excitement of the first snowfall in December, animals we barely knew existed suddenly leaped to life in tracks and traces. Early one cold January morning, I stepped out onto the lightly dusted sidewalk and within three houses, I counted the tracks of eight different creatures, two different birds, a squirrel, a rabbit, a raccoon, a cat, a dog with its owner, and my tracks made nine. I looked around at the street and houses and I asked myself, what are they doing here? The tracks of the animals we will look at today are residents. Others migrate, but these animals live here all year long. In spring, summer, and fall, they must find a mate, defend territory, feed, and raise young. Beginning in fall, their attention turns to strategies for winter survival. They put on fat reserves, store food, go into winter sleep or torpor, add a warmer coat, change their diet, or do a combination of the above. In winter, they have three tasks, eat, stay warm, and find safety. When we examine the tracks and signs of animals, we discover what they eat, where they find shelter, and how they stay safe. And why do we track? Animals leave evidence of their activity. In winter, we not only find tracks, but also scat, urine, 
recently chewed vegetation called browse, snow beds, tree rubs and scrapes, digging in snow, kill sites, pellets coughed up by owls, roosting sites, burrows, tunnels, dens. We can go on an adventure. In winter, you can go on an adventure by following the trail of an animal. See where it stops, where it's turned, and found something to eat, or dove into a burrow, or climbed a tree, or went into a gallop, perhaps, to escape a predator. In Becoming the Animal, I'm going to give you three exercises that you can do with a partner or in a group, which I call Becoming the Animal. Here's the first one. Have someone walk out in fresh snow to create a U-shape, a single line, a turn, and then coming back to the start in a single line. Watch how the person moves. Now examine the individual tracks they make. Measure the foot. Measure the width of the trail from the outside of one foot to the outside of the other. And then measure the length of stride from toe tip to toe tip. Also note any individual characteristics of the movement suggested by the tracks, such as pressing down on one foot or the other, or one foot slightly angled. You now should be able to identify those tracks anywhere they go as belonging to that person. This is tracking. Today, we will look at or talk about 30 different animals across most of Ontario and Quebec. These are winter animals, these are residents. I chose photos of tracks that best represent most of these animals. Keep in mind that while I'm showing only one or two photos, there's a great variety of tracks depending on age of animal, its gender, the speed it travels, and behavior. Other considerations include snow conditions, age of track, depth of snow and terrain. For each species, I have included a quick key to their tracks. F means front foot measured in width by length. H is the hind foot. T means trail width measured from the outside of the left paw to the outside of the right. S means stride length, which is measured from the tip of the front foot to the tip of where it next lands. And keep in mind, these are average sizes to help just give you scale to help you identify one animal from another. The way an animal moves determines the tracks it leaves. Movement depends on body shape, size, and weight. All of this information we can read in the tracks. What they eat and where they live gives us further clues. All of the animals we will look at fit into one of these four basic gait patterns, walkers, bounders, hoppers, and waddlers. As in the measurements, these patterns are generalized. In reality, we find that animals leaving tracks of different patterns based on how fast they're going. We will concentrate on the patterns they make when they are feeding and moving without threat from a predator. Well, let's get introduced to these animals, but first, I'll let you know there is a short quiz at the end where you will have to identify an animal and match it to its gait pattern. So listen for the clues. Walkers. The walkers are the largest group of animals. Their body shapes are all similar with one exception. They have long bodies with large head and chest on relatively long legs. Because of the way they are built, these animals must move two legs at a time, but from opposite sides of their bodies. In other words, their front right leg moves with their hind left. These animals move in an alternating pattern, also known as a diagonal walk, where the hind foot steps into the same place the front has just left. What does this look like in the snow? As in the photo, you will see a line of tracks that are going in left-right alternating pattern. Who uses this walking pattern? The domestic cat, the bobcat, domestic dog, coyote, wolf, fox, deer, and muskrat. 
the domestic cat. The domestic cat's tracks are generally small, round, and asymmetrical, with their claws rarely showing. In this photo, all four paws register independently. The front toe leads, followed by the smaller hind. It is in a slow walk with a short stride. Note the shape of its heel pad. It has a small dip in the center at the top, while the bottom has three tiny lobes. And while cats generally have five toes in the front paw, the fifth is a dew claw that is higher up on the leg and does not register in the snow. Next, we have the bobcat. The bobcat's tracks are similar to the domestic cats, but larger, with the hind paw more elongated for more powerful leaps. The front paw is large and round. Note in this photo, the front paws register heavier than the hind, and the toes point in towards the center, indicating right and left. This pattern looks to me like it was in a trot by its hind leg overstepping its front and in its even side, in its even stride. The domestic dog. The most common tracks you will find in the urban landscape belong to the domestic dog. They are highly variable in size and shape. Common characteristics are four toes widely spaced with prominent claws in a symmetrical look. You should be able to draw an X between the toe and the heel pads without in intersecting either of them. Note the blunt claw marks, typical of domestic dogs. And also, like the cat, the front paws are slightly larger than the hind. So in this photo, the, the top track on the upper left is the front and the next one is the hind. But the most telling feature about domestic dogs is their behavior when outside. They know where their next meal is going to come from. They know they are safe and therefore can explore every pole, bush and fire hydrant. They get to run and play, not like their wild cousins. Like domestic dog tracks, the coyote tracks are symmetrical in shape with the front larger than, than the hind and four toes with claw marks. However, their claws are sharper than the domestic dogs with two leading straight forward. In the track of the coyote, look for a compact oval shape like you see in the photo here. Their behavior is very different from the domestic dogs. Because they don't know where their next meal is going to come from, they must constantly hunt. Their movement is serious, business-like, trotting in more or less straight lines over long distances. The Algonquin Wolf. The Algonquin Wolf is found across central Ontario in Algonquin Park into Quebec. Sometimes it is called the Eastern Wolf, which may be a separate species. The eastern wolf is a species under threat in Canada. The Algonquin wolf was added as a species at risk in Ontario. It is often confused with the coyotes. Its tracks are larger than the coyote, but smaller than the gray wolf, which is a more western species. Also note that their tracks are more round than the coyote's oval shape. Red fox tracks are similar to coyote, but smaller, with notable addition of fur in the toes and a chevron-shaped depression in the heel pad of the front paw. Fur in the paws mean their tracks are less distinct than the snow. Scat placement for both species are in prominent places such as trails. However, fox scat is smaller usually one centimeter by 10 centimeters versus coyote two and a half centimeters by 12 to 20 centimeters. Red fox scent mark territory and for breeding purposes in January and February, which smells like skunk. At this time of the year, the skunk is in a long sleep known as torpor and may come out in mild conditions. But when I smell a skunk in January, I go looking for signs of a fox. The white-tailed deer 
walk on narrow cloven hooves that puncture deep snow with the hind foot falling into the place vacated by the front. This is known as direct register and is typical of all walking gates. This gate allows for efficiency of energy, speed, and quiet movement. Not stepping on a stick, making a snapping sound with their front hoof, means they know the hind will land in the same quiet spot. In our more northern regions, you may come across elk tracks. Elk tracks are larger than white-tailed deer, with larger pad making a wider, more round shape in the snow. Muskrats are the exception to the general physiology of walkers, but do have a walking gait. However, in winter, you are less likely to see it up on shore and more likely to see it out on the ice tending big piles of mud full of water-loving plants, which they use as store food stores. So on this photo, you can see where the muskrat has come up from the water in the mud and tracked onto the snowy ice and uh, made distinct tracks, but also brought in all that mud. Good indication that it's a, a muskrat. Then we have birds. Birds are walkers too. They are two-footed creatures who walk and hop and come in all sizes. Most birds have three toes pointing forward and one back. This photo is of a wild turkey tracks showing the round metatarsal pad dot in the center with a short back claw in the leading foot. The back claw doesn't always show in the turkey tracks, but usually do in all other perching birds. Now we get to the bounders. Bounders are long-bodied animals with short legs. They move quickly in long leaps. Both front feet lift off, allowing the back feet to take their place. This gives them conservation of energy and greater speed. What does this look like in the snow? You will see a series of pairs of paw prints more or less side by side, as in the photo. Sometimes the pairs of prints are separated by body drags and you can, you can by, by body drag marks, which you can see in the photo as well. Who are the bounders? Fishers, martens, weasels, mink, otter, all of which are carnivores. And here's a fun group exercise in becoming the animal. Examine the four different gait patterns that we're learning about today and practice them in the snow. Get on all fours and become a bounder. The fisher is the largest member of this group in this region. The four photos here show a change in speed from the fast two by two lope to the slowest alternating walk. These patterns are typical of all bounders. Fishers prefer to hunt in the forest and are good tree climbers. The martin. Martins are smaller than fishers, although a large male martin may be the same size as a female fisher. Two important distinctions between the martin and the fisher is that the martin is half the weight of the fisher, giving a lighter impression in the snow, and the martin's heel pad is furry, making it less distinguishable and smaller than the fisher. The gait pattern in this photo is of a rotary lope where the left hind and front overstep each other in which the marten has picked up speed. Short-tailed weasel and long-tailed weasel. We'll look at them together. The short-tailed weasel is sometimes called the stoat or ermine. The short-tailed weasel also has a more northern range than the long-tailed. These animals must hunt constantly in the winter, diving in burrows and under the snow in search of voles and mice, usually at high speed. The 
the long-tailed weasel. These two, the short and the long-tailed, are, are very difficult to tell apart. In summer, both animals have brown fur above and white below with a black tip to their tail. In winter, both molt to all white, leaving the tail tip black. It is thought that when chased, the black tip confuses predators. Although the short-tailed weasel is smaller, it's easier to think of three different sizes between the two. The short-tailed female is the smallest. The short-tailed male and the long-tailed female are similar in size, with the long-tailed male as the largest. And just to confuse us further, there is another species of weasel which is called the least weasel. It is the smallest weasel and is rare. Weasels move between water's edge and forest. Mink are larger than the long-tailed weasel, but smaller than the fisher. It is a dark brown fur with white patch of fur under its chin. Mink do not change to white in the winter like the weasels. Look for body and tail drag, as you see in the photo. They prefer to hunt along shorelines and in winter, weaving up and down logs and rocks, exploring burrows and diving in one side of a snowdrift to pop up on the other side. River otter. River otters are large, water-loving creatures with similar tracks to the fisher, except that you should see webbing between the toes, and it prefers to hunt for fish. When bounding or walking in snow, you can often see the tail drag. The most striking feature of the otters in winter is their love of sliding in slow, uh, snow, as you can see there. Animals who register all four paws in the snow as a group with powerful hind feet landing ahead of their front are known as hoppers. These include most rodents, squirrels, mice, voles, rabbits, and hares. Gray and red squirrels tracks are similar in shape and placement with the red squirrels tracks being smaller. Both are active in winter and both are tree climbers. Look for tracks racing across the snow from tree to tree. Gray squirrels will dig in the snow to retrieve buried nuts below. Whereas red squirrels cache nuts in tree cavities. Red squirrels will tap maple trees, saplings, by biting horizontally in the cambium layer, releasing sap for a fun winter sugary snack. Deer mice run across the snow or tunnel beneath. Deer mice are common in woodlands, dragging long tails behind them. Meadow voles have small eyes, short ears, and short tails, and can be found in the meadows with thick cover, often tunneling under the snow or bravely racing into the open. The eastern cottontail rabbit have tracks similar to squirrels with hind feet landing and pushing off ahead of the front. Their front paws are often offset, as you see in the photo here, and not side by side like the squirrels. Rabbit feet are also larger and less distinct because of fur in the toes. Rabbits spend time feeding on small seedling trees, brambles, and the bark of saplings. You will also find their scat, round dry pellets, in their feeding areas. Snowshoe hare, on the other hand, have oversized hind paws covered in fur, making it perfectly adaptable to long snowy winters. They prefer woodlands with some low cover. Look for brows as high as 60 centimeters above the snow and beds in the snow under low hanging pine trees. The waddlers, this is the fun group. Waddlers move in an overstep pattern in which the hind leg steps ahead of the front. There are exceptions due to travel speed, snow conditions, and terrain. This pattern is made by large, wide-bodied animals with relatively short legs, such as bears, porcupines, 
beaver, and raccoon. If you could watch them move, you would see both feet on one side of the body move before the other. And we'll see that later on. Here's a third exercise in becoming the animal. Animals come in all shapes and sizes. When you're outside examining an animal track or trail, crouch down and imagine how big the animal might be based on the size of the tracks. Imagine its trail width and the length of its stride. Look at where it goes in and out of the trees or shrubs and shape with your hand or air sculpt the contours of the animal as it moves. Porcupine. Porcupine make tracks in snow that show their large hind feet and instep pattern and claw marks without the toes registering. You will see some drag marks depending on snow depth. Drag marks can be made by paws, quills, or even the tail. When more than one follow each other, they create a trough of snow snaking to and from their rocky dens. In winter, they search choice trees to climb, stripping bark off to eat the juicy cambium layer. In this photo, the porcupine is walking in a pattern with the hind slightly overstepping the front, showing tail drag down the center. Beaver are classic waddlers, but are better known for their habitat, activity, and large tail. They rarely come up on land in winter, preferring to stay in ponds foraging from stick piles they have built last fall in the water near their lodge. When they do come up for shore, looking, look for recently cut branches or chewed bark and look for that wide tail. The raccoon track is called an overstep in which its hind leg pairs with the opposite front. For instance, in this photo, the hind right landed beside the front left in the leading set of tracks, followed by the hind left beside the right front, making up a four track pattern. There are of course exceptions in track patterns due to turning, slowing down and speeding up. A notable feature of raccoon tracks in winter is their behavior. They come out of several weeks of torpor to feed. Foraging brings them from dens or tree cavities to wet areas, ponds, streams in search of bugs, nuts, worms, or hibernating frogs. Their trails are best described as indecisive or wandering, constantly changing directions, but in truth, they really know their habitat. Let's get on to the quiz. Now that you've seen their tracks, let's look for some of the animals that made them. Put your answers in the comments. Give yourself a point for each right answer and an extra point if you recall a feature of their tracks. Here's your first. What species is this? And what gait pattern does it use to move? It's an Eastern coyote, and of course it's a walker. But if you guessed Algonquin wolf, give yourself a point. If you answered you were unable to tell the difference between the two, give yourself three points. And add an extra five points if you said the species cannot be determined unless you examine its tracks. <laughs> For this. Oh. Here's the next. What species is this? And what gait pattern does it use to move? It's a mink and it's a bounder. Notice the patch of white fur under the chin. What species is this? And what gait pattern does it use to move? And if you guess that it's a red squirrel, you'll be right, and it's a hopper. A quick identifying feature of the red squirrels is its white eye ring. Look for the white eye ring. 
Now, who is this and what gait pattern does it use to move? It's a white-tailed deer and it's a walker. And who is this? What gait pattern does this animal use to move? And it's a river otter and it's a bounder. Notice its water environment, but also check out that very thick and powerful tail that it uses for swimming. Who is this? And what gait pattern does it use? It's an Eastern cottontail and it's a hopper. You might have guessed snowshoe hair because it's photos from this from the spring when they change their coats, but its hind paws look like they're several sizes too big for the animal. The snow, and the snowshoe hare's ears are always finely lined with black fur, whether it's summer or winter. So this could only be the cottontail rabbit. What species is this one? And you have two questions. What gait pattern does it use to move? And where does the hind foot land in a common walking pace? And of course we have the raccoon and it's a waddler. Its hind foot lands beside its front. Notice both front and hind legs on the right side are in the air while the left side is grounded of this raccoon in this photo. How did you do in the quiz? Tell us in the comments. Here's one more fun exercise you can do anytime exploring animal tracks in your neighborhood and following them. When you can no longer follow the animal's tracks, safely go back where you started and backtrack the animal to discover where it came from. Look for other signs of its activity along the way. And many thanks to all the people who put this webinar together. Check out the resources, download the iNaturalist app on your phone, Grab a cheap plastic ruler, find some tracks, and upload your findings. Happy tracking from Wintergreen. That, that was great. Thank you. Thank you, Hilbert. I was Thank like, you. I especially like the quiz at the end. I think it looks like a lot of people did too. They got, uh, got engaged with that. And I'm definitely, as we're going through this, I'm definitely going to start packing a ruler with my uh, field field book and and all that to be able to put it out there yeah good idea perfect so we do have some questions in the chat and it's like we have um, a couple minutes to get through that so the first question is can you describe the effect of melting snow on animal tracks mm, yeah that's a good question um it, and it's really important to keep that in consideration when you're looking at tracks what I look for in the melting snow is the difference between the melting snow at the top of the track, if you could imagine the track having depth, and the bottom of the track, because the bottom of the track will probably be more true to the size of the animal's uh, true track than the top, because it will look much larger as it melts this way. Perfect. Okay, so then the next question I have for you is, do fishers slide on the snow sometimes too? <laughs> I have never seen it and I, I don't know. Do fishers have fun? I bet they do. <laughs> Alrighty, so another question is, um, so we understand that the distance between paws indicates the speed of the animal. So if the distance is large, it moves slower than when the distance is small. And presumably the size of the paws indicates age. Um, so I guess they're just asking you to confirm, is that the case when you're looking for tracking and the kind of information that you would gather for that? Um, I, I sort of heard two things. So the, the stride length, the longer the stride length, the faster the animal is going. Does that answer that? Yes, I believe so. They were looking for the stride length. Does that kind of indicate 
um, the speed that the animal was going at, and then the paw size. That indicates potentially the age or the sex of the animal. Paw sizes, there's so many variables. Like, like I said, there, there are many overlaps between creatures, and you just have to have a general idea about what the what the typical track size of your animal is, and then compare it to others. Perfect. So another question is, do you have any tips on determining a fresh track versus an old track? Of determining a fresh track? Yeah. How yeah. do we tell the difference between a fresh track versus an old track that may look a little bit fresh? Yeah, yeah. What does a fresh track look like? It's it's easier to talk about what what a deteriorated uh, older track uh, looks like. You know, it's going to be rounded and it's going to be filled in and it's going to be looking wider. Um, always look for the freshest tracks that you can find. Really, you know, the the ones that look pristine. Perfect. Um, so another question is: Do cats ever show claw marks on their tracks? Or is that something that they never do? Um, it's not likely that they will have uh, claw marks showing. Don't forget, cats have retractable claws. So they can pull the claw back into their paw or stretch it out if they're catching an animal, for instance. So when they're in their normal walking uh, pace, walking pattern, the tracks generally do not show up. Perfect. Um, so another question is, it's often difficult to photograph tracks due to low contrast. Do you have any tips on photographing tracks in various conditions? Photograph early morning and late late afternoon when the sun is more uh, at, a, at a slant. Um, I have in the past, I've used um, a, a small flashlight just to shine it across the track just to get more contrast. Uh, other than that, uh, just take the most pristine one that you can and maybe do a little creative edit uh, in, in your programs to just enhance the, the look of that. It really does help uh, to get a clear picture of it. Perfect. So we have a few more. Um, someone asked if you can touch on what is required to register and do a test to become certified in tracking, if you have any information on that. Whoa. The organization is called Cyber Tracking, and there are a number of places in uh, Ontario and Quebec um, that will host them. Uh, I would look for Cyber Tracking under uh, Google or or Tracking uh, Guides or Tracking, um, you know, whatever whatever useful terms are there. And what they do is they take ten people on uh, two days. And they lead the ten people to a, a, a track or something that's happening in the in the landscape, and they ask two or three questions about it, and you have to answer the questions separately, and then they get together as a group right then and there and talk about the track that that the, is questioned. The beauty of this is that you don't have to know anything about tracking. You can go in and have a great experience and learn so much. Or you could go for the paperwork and uh, and uh, get some certification level. Okay, someone just asked in the chat if you could repeat the name of that school again, because they didn't hear the full thing. Yeah, it's, um, it, I, I don't have it at my fingertips. It's, it, it, but if you look under cyber tracking as one word, um, you will get all kinds of hits on, uh, on organizations that do this. Cyber tracking is the overall, the international uh, body. Perfect. And someone asked, can you comment on what are the largest and smallest tracks that maybe you have found here in Canada so wow. far? Wow. Uh, the largest would have had to have been that uh, Eastern Wolf on um, at Wintergreen. Uh, those are pretty large tracks. Um, the it's the deer mice and the and the voles that makes little teeny weeny uh, tracks as they as they race along. Um, I'm trying to think of if I've ever seen any insect tracks. <laughs> I can't say that I have. Perfect. Um, quickly, someone said, could you describe the difference in hoof prints between a moose and a deer? 
I I cannot comment on the moose. It's it's going to be pretty big, <laughs> quite a bit bigger. I'm sorry, I don't have that information. That's okay. Someone said, and I think this might be our last one, but would mud tracks look the same as they would look in snow tracks? Wow. Yeah, there's a good question. Uh, the substrate snow and substrate mud are very different in uh, in how they they look. Obviously, with snow, you can have some depth depth of the track, but also deterioration. Whereas in mud, um, it tends to be very thin. So as long as the animal is uh, putting their track in like in a really pristine spot with uh, you know a bit of a hard base on it, you'll get a really beautiful track. And if it dries correctly, <laughs> that track will stay the same for for a long time. Um, but winter tracking is really very different from spring, summer, and fall tracking because of that that reason. Is the tracks tend to be pretty subtle in the in the spring, summer, and fall. Perfect. Um, I think we will leave it there. Thank you. But. James, if you have any final words. Yeah, no, I just want to say thank you, Hilbert. That was extremely um, informative, interesting, and I'm sure everybody's got a great new appreciation for tracks, um, myself included. And uh, thank you to everybody who's took the time to, to listen in. Um, there were a couple of questions about whether this is the recording was going to be available. I mentioned it in the chat, but it's probably buried further up. But um, um, yes, it will be available. Everybody who's registered will get an email saying uh, when the recording is available, and it will also be posted on our website. Um, at the uh, best place to do that is to just Google CWF webinars, um, and then you'll be able to find it there. And um, yeah, and for everybody um, asking about tracks and mud and and kind of non-winter, then keep in mind the City Nature Challenge coming up at the end of April. Um, and it works for more than just tracks. And um, until then, we'll have a couple of webinars uh, about observing and and um, submitting observations for the City Nature Challenge as well um, in early to mid-April. Excellent. Well, thanks, thanks again thanks. for taking us on that winter journey. And I'm sure everyone's maybe hoping for some snow so that we can put our new tracking skills to use. You can still get out there and find them. And thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.